Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about how you went from one cell to many. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Organisms have various developmental pathways. Asexual prokaryotes reproduce through binary fission. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, recombine their chromosomes during meiosis, which we discussed in cell cycles, giving rise to genetically distinct offspring. In isogamous species, the gametes are of similar size and morphology. However, in anisogamous species, gametes are different in size or morphology or both. We are a special type of anisogamous called oogamous, where our gametes are different in both size and morphology. Now, because this video is in the zoology playlist, we will focus specifically on overall embryonic development in animals. Plant and fungal development won't be treated here, though they are fascinating too. In animals, sperm are tiny flagellated cells, remnants of our opisthokont ancestry, while eggs, called ova, are large, relatively speaking, non-motile cells. Like us, sponges, comb jellies, jellyfish, and all other sexually reproducing animals produce sperm and ova. The sperm fertilizes the ovum, and because both are haploid, meaning they only have half their complete set of chromosomes, they join to form a diploid zygote. The zygote is no more or less alive than either its predecessor or descendant cells. It's just a cell with a full set of chromosomes. Anyone who tells you otherwise doesn't really know what they're talking about. But with its full complement, it starts to divide into daughter cells. The division of cells in the early embryo is known as cleavage. First, the zygote splits into two daughter cells, then four, then eight. Once it reaches 16 cells, it has become a solid mass called a morula. Along the way, cells orient themselves, which will eventually determine how the body plan is laid out. Some animals display what is known as radial cleavage, in which the cells seem to be oriented in the same way on top of each other. In spiral cleavage, on the other hand, the daughter cells orient at oblique angles to the parent cell angles, which from the top looks like the cells are spiraling. Thereafter, the embryo forms a fluid-filled center that eventually becomes known as the blastocele. As for the overall morphology, the embryo has become a hollow sphere, the blastula. In sponges, after they reach blastula stage, they develop into larvae that later develop into adults. One of the many signature characteristics of animals is their ability to deform the structure of their bodies during morphogenesis by the collective work of contractile cells. This process underlies the next stage in animal development. The origins of collective cell contraction animals remained unclear until October 2019, when a paper by Brunette et al. was published. It described a new species, Coenoeca flexa. This is a coenoflagellate, a member of the clade of protists that are the closest relatives of animals. The cells of this particular species form colonies, which can invert their shape in response to changes in light intensity from a ball of cells with the flagella on the outside into a cup-shaped form with the flagella on the inside. The former seems optimal for locomotion, while the latter is for feeding. Brunette et al. found that the mechanisms for collective cell contraction are conserved between this coenoflagellate and animals, indicating that the common ancestor of both was also capable of cell contraction even before the evolution of multicellularity. All eumetazoans, i.e. all animals except for sponges, undergo gastrulation following the blastula stage, forming the gastrula. During gastrulation, the single-layered blastula is organized into layers. One side of the blastula invaginates and deepens. In animals with two germ layers, called diploblasts, the outside of the gastrula is composed of ectoderm, and the invaginated tissue is composed of endoderm. All other animals are triploblasts, and we will return to this shortly. In vertebrates, the ectoderm gives rise to the epidermis, nervous system, and neural crest. Meanwhile, the endoderm gives rise to the epithelium of the digestive and respiratory systems. The internal space of the gastrula is called the archenteron, and the opening to it is called the blastopore. 
In most Tenophores and Nidarians, the Archenteron doesn't connect to the Endoderm a second time, so waste is expelled back through the mouth. Imagine if humans had to do such a thing. Placozoans, though, have a system that is extremely unusual for animals where they secrete digestive enzymes into their surroundings, similar to fungi. All bilaterally symmetrical animals, though, are triploblasts, meaning they have three germ layers. The third layer is the mesoderm, which lies between the ecto- and endoderm. In vertebrates, the mesoderm gives rise to many cell types, including bones, muscles, and connective tissues. The most basal bilaterians are acelomate flatworms of the phylum Xenocelomorpha. They too have no separate anus, meaning waste is expelled through the mouth. Interestingly, the cell cleavage of acelomate flatworms is radial, like in deuterostomes, indicating that radial cleavage is probably ancestral among bilaterians. After gastrulation occurs, the archenteron extends all the way through the gastrula, forming an anus on one end and a mouth on the other. In protostomes, which are cephalopods, tardigrades, arthropods, etc., the blastopore becomes the mouth, while the anus forms second. In deuterostomes, echinoderms and chordates, the blastopore becomes the anus, while the mouth forms second. As Aaron Ra likes to say, Then there is actually a time in your life when all you were was literally just an asshole. Protostomes and deuterostomes also develop differently with regard to their mesoderm. In protostomes, the coelom develops from mesodermal tissue concentrated on opposite sides of the arch and teron, called schizocele. In deuterostomes, the coelom forms from mesodermal pockets that pinch off from the arch and teron, called enterocele. Indeed, we share enterocelous development with starfish and acorn worms, which must be very strange if we're not related to them at all. Furthermore, remember that we are well within the bilaterians, i.e. animals with bilateral symmetry. But starfish, as well as other echinoderms, seem to be the odd one out in that they are radially symmetrical. However, echinoderms still retain their bilaterian heritage in their ontogeny, as their larvae are bilaterally symmetrical. Once again, very strange if they are not related to bilaterians. Within our phylum, all chordates grow a notochord, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, a postanal tail, and pharyngeal slits during development. These can then be lost or change into other structures throughout ontogeny. For instance, our pharyngeal slits give rise to structures in our neck and face. We humans also reduce our postanal tail to the point that only a few vertebrae exist. Within chordata, a number of animals grow fetally inside an amniotic sac, the ones who do being called amniotes, including reptiles, birds, and mammals. Within our class, all mammals develop hair, lactal mammaries, and three middle ear bones, and placental mammals are nourished for an extended period throughout their fetal development by a placenta. And so we finish our journey. The various stages of development from gamete to embryo to fetus link us both with all other animals, and even some protists, which should certainly give us pause on how much of our ontogeny has been shaped by evolution. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.